Good morning. Good morning, Rabbi. You all love very much the clean team. Sweet. Um, I want to say good morning to everybody, too, who uh, tunes in. Um, and uh, I think today's going to be pretty special, actually. Um, it was good that you clapped after, I think. It's appropriate that you clapped after the silver trumpets. The silver trumpets were always used in the Bible and Numbers and the Torah. The foundation of the word to um, call the people to worship. So if you're clapping, you're, you're, I guess you're excited that you're going to worship, right? Yeah. Which, which I guess is more than appropriate for the children of God to be excited to worship, right? They're having a conference. Um, Southern Baptists are having a conference in Tennessee that I was invited to speak at. Uh, three of the speakers, besides myself, um, they're pretty heavy hitters. You know, one guy has a, I think, a 10,000 member church in Memphis. And one guy has an incredibly exploding church in um, Las Vegas. And um, the theme of the conference is how to conduct yourself as a believer, maybe as a Christian. In a, in a world that's anti-Christian, which, which I guess makes sense, but you know, I just got to tell you, um, I'm not a big fan of, of three pillars and five, you know, principles or ten tenets. You know that by now, right? Um, I don't believe in formulas because God is, you can't, you can't get a formula out of him. And to me... It does not matter if I was in a town or a city or a country where everybody was a believer or I was in a town where nobody was a believer. You follow? What's the difference? I mean, think about it. What, what's the difference? Do you think Daniel conducted himself any different when he was in Jerusalem than when he was in Babylon? Babylon, you couldn't find a place any more anti-God than Babylon. So, so what's my point? The world's going to pot. The world has been going to pot for the longest time. And by the way, nobody was born saved. So you were part of that pot. And now you're not. So just... Be happy and content that the Lord pulled you out of that. Um, this is a psalm. Um, it's really about the Messiah. And so if you read it in context and thinking about Messiah, um, I think it would make sense to you. Anything I, I share with you, anything I tell you based on um, reading of the word or a meditation, um, you, you don't, I've, I've never asked you to embrace it, ever, never, ever, and I never will. Um, it's, you know, the Bible says that I shouldn't study to show you approved. The Bible says that you need to study to show yourself approved. And everybody's theology in this room is a little different. Don't, don't, don't get crazy. Like, I might say something that's a little different than your theology, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I, I'm done. But... I could be wrong, but it could, could it be that you are too? Because the fact is that nobody in here has ironclad theology. You, you realize this would be a great place to start. You all, including myself, see in part. We see through a glass dimly. There's some absolute basic theological principles that are irrefutable. And then there's some questionable items. But I, I can tell you that walking with the Lord at this stage, for me, is, is not about obligation. 
There's no obligation. It's about desperation. It's, it's not about perfection. I've tried. It's about connection. And it is absolutely not about competency. Because everybody's incompetent when it comes to the Lord. It's about intimacy. It's about drawing close to him. It's about getting closer to that inapproachable light. Some people want to, and some people don't. The messages that I think we bring, I believe um, they're very much what you would hear in the first century. But sadly enough, today, uh, there is way more entertainment. Uh, there are way more jokes. And, and it's really come about the gospel of cash and Cadillacs. And even though, even, even mainline churches, I'm just here to tell you, I know because I have friends, mainline churches, it seeps in without you being aware of it. And it could seep into you and it could seep into me. You, you know, you know that if you throw a frog in boiling water, he will hop out every single time. But if you put in water about 100 degrees and you raise it a couple of degrees every hour, it will hit 212 and he will boil. And that's what the enemy does. He fries you slowly. It's like a simmer. So I'm just telling you that uh, in order to get close to the Lord, there is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way than to die to yourself. And everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And it's painful. It's painful. At the end of Romans, when he says, present yourself, Paul says to the body of believers, this, this Gentile body of believers, he says, now that you're in, present yourself a living sacrifice. What do you think that means? To present yourself a living sacrifice, to present your flesh on the altar to be burned. It is the most uncomfortable thing. But I'm here to tell you, you can be saved and not necessarily go through that process per se, as long as you're not walking in just ridiculous sin. But if you're here and your soul, not your body, because your body will not want to be burned. Don't listen to your body. If your soul cry is to draw closer to the Lord, know this, there is no other way. So if you're looking for an alternative, stop looking. If you don't want to take that route, the Lord will not force you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe some of you know this. Maybe some of you don't know this. I don't know. But when you talk to the body of believers today in America, this is foreign. This is foreign. All they want is a Savior. All I know is Jesus paid the price. You think he paid the price to keep you in the situation you're in? Or did he pay the price to see you transformed to be like him? He was the very son of man, and it says he learned obedience by the things he suffered. The very son of man, the prophesied Messiah, the king of Israel, learned obedience by the things he suffered. Do you really think that he took that route and we just kicked back? It's not even in the Bible. But then again, who's reading the Bible? Who's really reading the Bible? How many of us got into the Word this week and actually studied a couple of words to find out what it meant? I, 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 I wish I could be different. I try so hard. I just want to be jovial, tell a few jokes, and let you leave here. But what's going to happen is I have to be accountable. I have to be accountable, so I'm concerned about that accountability. I'm fearful of that accountability. Not only that, but when it hits the fan, and it will, those folks will not be prepared. They will not. In Desert Storm, when they said, what are you guys going to do about chemical warfare? And they said, we've trained for it. You follow? So with that in mind, I just wanted to get that off my chest because it's been a lot of meditation this week. And I just want you to understand that the Word of God is not there to hurt you. It's there to edify you. And edification just doesn't mean to build up because sometimes when you put up an edifice, the old edifice has to be torn down. 
And in order for God to build his kingdom, he's going to tear down yours. I know he's been doing it to me for the last 27 years. Every time I start laying a stone that is not of him, it's torn down. Not fun. Nobody said this was fun. Yeshua never said, hey guys, come follow me. It's going to be fun. In fact, if you read, he said just the opposite. He said, it's going to cost you everything, even your lives. And all 12. <laughs> yes or no? So why are we preaching another gospel? Why aren't we preaching what he preached? I just, I don't understand it. I, 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 I just, I'm, I must be missing something. I, I'm not getting it. Okay. Yeshua in Psalm 16, protect me, God, for you are my refuge. Okay, he needed protection, so do you think maybe we do? I said to Adonai, you are my Lord. I have nothing good outside of you. It doesn't mean he wasn't good. It doesn't mean he sinned. He's just acknowledging the perfection of his Father. The holy people in the land are the ones who are worthy of honor. All my pleasure is in them. Do you hear what he's saying? The holy people of the land, if you're born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, he's referring to you. He's saying that you are the excellent of the earth. You might not feel that way. Maybe it's humility. Maybe it's self-deprecation. I don't know. But the fact remains, this is what Yeshua says in the word. That you're the excellent of the earth. I have met the excellent of the earth in Kenya. I've met the excellent of the earth in India. I've met him in Israel. I've met him in Argentina. I've met him all over Central America. The excellent of the earth are all over the world. There is a remnant. There is a remnant and they are absolutely positively sold out. Those who run after another God multiply their sorrows. To such gods I will not offer. He's saying I will not offer drink offerings of blood or take. Yeshua says I won't even take their names on my lips. I won't even give them a name. I won't even acknowledge them in my mind. I don't know, my assigned portion, my cup, you safeguard my share. Totally secure. Pleasant places were measured out for me. I am content with my heritage. That's my inheritance. That's my portion. Are you content with your heritage? Are you content with your portion? Is it not enough to live eternally in a blissful state with the presence of the Lord? Is it not enough to see this world restored? New heavens, new earth. Is it not enough to be back in Eden when there was no sin, no sorrow, no sadness? Is that not enough? I bless Adonai, my counselor. At night, my inmost being instructs me. The Spirit is telling him, bless the Lord. The Spirit is telling us, bless the Lord. And now in the last four verses, this is quoted in Acts 2, 25 through 33. It's amazing. It, it talks about that Yeshua's lifeless body will be kept from corruption for three days. A miracle upon miracles. Three days and three nights. The miracle of preservation. And it's giving us hope. It says, I always set Adonai before me with him at my right hand. It's not literal. The right hand is a, is a place it's figurative, it's symbolic in the Bible. All over the Psalms, it's the place of power. It's the place of safety. It's the place of honor. It's the place of favor. It's the place of pleasure. That's what he's saying. With the Lord, I have power, I'm safe, I have favor, I'm honored, I'm supported. So he says, so my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. And my body too rests in safety. He said, for you will not abandon me to Sheol, the place of death, the grave. It's not hell. Sheol is not hell. When the unbeliever dies, they go to the grave. When the believer dies, they go to the grave. The spirit and the soul, for the unbeliever, a state of suffering, according to Luke 16. The believer, the spirit and the soul, goes with Messiah. I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm just telling you the theology that grandma is dancing with the Lord, she can't dance without a body. Her spirit and her soul are with the Lord at total peace. 
That's why it says the dead in Messiah will rise first and get their new bodies. How can they get a new body now? Then get rid of the new body and then get another new body? It's three bodies. I don't want to hurt you, but grandma is fine. She's doing so much better than we are. Paul said to die is gain. It's the truth. And then last verse says, you will not let your faithful one see the abyss. We'll not remain in the disbodied state. We will get a new body. And I could really, really use one. If you happen to know any, I don't do the internet, but if there's any bodies for sale on eBay or something, let me know. I'll start bidding. I really, really need one. You will make me know the path of life. Life. In your presence is unabounded joy. Unabounded. There's no end. It's the fullness. It overflows. He's talking about something in the future. Yeshua is talking about once I get out of this grave. He's prophesying. I'm going to be in your presence and then I will have the fullness. Did he have the fullness of joy on the earth? Guys, I, I know people say, well, Yeshua had to laugh. I'm sure he laughed here and there. Can you show me a verse? I'll show you plenty of times he cried. Which, which Yeshua do you know? The Yeshua that you're making up in your mind? The God of your image? Or, or the Yeshua that we have in the Holy Scriptures? What should I, what should I attest to? What should I witness to? What should I, what should I grab my information from? The Holy Bible or your dream? Because you had a pizza last night with pepperoni and you dreamed freaky dreams. <laughs> Science proves this. Sometimes it's just bad food and indigestion. I'm going to believe what the Word of God says. He was a man of sorrows. A man of sorrows. But once he was resurrected and ascended, he was a man with unabounded joy. I could just be so happy in this life. I'm sorry. You might think me nuts. You're nuts. Mm -mm. If you know what goes on in India and Africa and even here in this country, even sometimes in this very room with people, how can you just laugh it off? I laugh, of course. And why do I use humor? Because if I don't cr laugh sometimes, I'll go into a state of depression. So I have to laugh. And I try to get you to laugh sometimes because if I just give you the word straight, it's, it's almost no recovery. You make me know the path of life. In your presence is unabounded joy. At your right hand, that place of honor and favor is eternal delight. You see where he's going? He's not worried about the here and now. He's not worried about the, the crucifixion. He's not worried about his burial. He's only, his mission is to get back up in the presence of the Father. If it's his mission, it should be our mission as well. Amen? Amen. Make sense? All right. This is my prayer. It's very simple. Father, I can only hope and I can only pray that everything we do today in this sanctuary would be a pleasing aroma. Let nothing we do or say or even think cause a stench in your nostrils. Father, for the people, I pray that they're edified, that they would grow in wisdom, including myself. I pray that they would be encouraged. I pray that you'd give us a persuasive discourse to help us draw closer to you. And Father, for those who are going through it, and I'm sure there are a big number, I pray that you give them consolation. I pray that they get comforted and they leave here with more peace. This I pray in the name above all names, Yeshua, amen and amen.